Let's start it up. Yes. Here we are. Welcome back. Another episode of Technical Knockout, the hardcore casual MMA podcast. I'm dressed casually, but I'm the hardcore fan. Jordan is dressed hardcorely, but he's the casual fan, self proclaimed casual fan. He's checking his notes. Uh, we are going to talk about UFC 297 today. Uh, this is a pretty good pay-per-view to start off the year. I mean, you know, maybe a couple snoozers in there, but uh, overall, I think it was a pretty solid card, all things considered. Uh, let's get right into it, Jordan. What did you think of that main event? Um, I know it was contentious. You know, some people uh, liked the decision. Some people didn't deci- like the decision. What I liked is that they promised to go to war, and they absolutely delivered on that one. Um I was probably a little bit more um, sided toward Strickland um, just because I tend to like the champion in uh, in those close ones. But I say that now and you'll hear me in like two or three episodes saying like, oh, man, he, that that uh, challenger should have got the split decision. So that should be taken with a uh, pinch of salt. Um, mm-hmm. I will say with some retrospect, there became time um, distance from that fight. I started seeing exactly why um ddp got the nod in that one he utilized the wrestling um not as much as i thought he would but enough to i think help him get um get that you know that razor's edge decision in his way um and we were talking a little bit before um before the record about how strickland just kind of hid behind his jab most of the times and then like you were saying um you know he kind of was able to win the rounds when he put the pressure on him um you know and I don't think DDP put too much extra pressure on him, but you could tell he was the one moving forward a little bit more. And and I can see from a judge's judge's point how you're like, okay, he's winning. He's putting the pressure on. He's creating the action. So, you know, again, you know, a contentious decision, but one I don't think I would be upset at either way. I can say I would love to see a rematch, though I do not think that it will benefit Sean Strickland very much. I think in a rematch, uh, Duplessis would get a much more dominant victory, if not a finish. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the fight was super close. It was a good fight. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I was, uh, I'm always a fan of the back and forth five round fights, you know. Uh, where one guy wins the first round, next guy wins the second round, and then there's like a, a toss-up round in the middle there somewhere. Uh, that's kind of how I, I felt this fight went down. I thought it was pre- pretty clear that Strickland won the first round. I thought Duplessis won the second round for sure. Uh, third round is the round where I felt like it could go either way, but I personally scored it for Duplessis. And then fourth round for Duplessis, easy, his best round of the fight. And then fifth round for Strickland, his best round of the fight. So um, it was a pretty back and forth fight, all things considered, regardless of the decision or anything like that. It was a pretty good showcase for both fighters. I do feel like Duplessis got the nod. I feel, well, he did get the nod. I feel like he won, in my opinion, um, because he, like you said, mixed in more than just uh, the boxing. Uh, Strickland had good boxing in this fight. He always has good boxing in his fights. Um, but he kind of fell into the trap that he had with the Cannoneer fight where he didn't do much more than jab and move. Um, and, you know, the rounds that he did do more than just jab, the first and the fifth, uh, were rounds that he won. So, you know, if you're Sean Strickland, if you're Sean Strickland's coach, I feel like you've got to be super frustrated with that performance um, because when he opened up, he won the round. Uh, and the rounds that he lost were because he simply didn't open up. Um, in that first round, he was landing that front kick to the body and he had great success with it. I called that, we talked about it in the preview, but, uh, Drickus is not a big fan of, uh, kicks to the body and Strickland was able to get a lot of success with that kick in the first round and then just forgot about it. I don't know what happened. Uh, his corner called for it after the, the second round. You can hear him go back to the corner and they're like, Hey man, don't forget about your teep. Use your teep. And, um, maybe he throws it once in the next round, but then forgets about it again. Uh, I think if he would have stayed consistent on that tool he would have had a lot more success uh in those middle rounds and then the fifth round uh the other round that i thought he won he won because he started throwing the overhand right uh instead of just jabbing he threw a right hand behind it crazy right isn't that such a wild concept um but you know i i i feel bad for the guy in the sense that you know this is another fight that he loses where it could have went either way um but i really feel like he has nobody to blame but himself for that um Duplessis on the hand did exactly what he was supposed to do uh he pressured the entire fight he kept 
shot on the back foot, which was, you know, huge for him. Um, he landed big power punches. He landed a very nice uh, step up high kick uh, from the lead leg. I didn't know that Duplessis had that kind of flexibility um, considering his build, considering the way he fights. So it was really impressive to see him throw. I think he even turned it into a question mark kick at one point, which was pretty sweet. Um, and then, of course, the takedowns. Uh, although he didn't do much with the takedowns, like he didn't stay on top super long, um, it was takedowns in a round that could have went either way. And in my opinion, that makes it go to the guy that gets a takedown. You know? um, I think it's important that you utilize all aspects of mixed martial arts, not just the boxing, not just the jab. And uh, Duplessis was the guy who did that by throwing in the, ki the kicks, the kicks to the body, the kicks to the head, um, and throwing in those takedowns as well. Um, both the guys had success with their hands, but Duplessis had more tools to use. So, um, yeah, I felt like he deserved that victory. He got the second, third, fourth round, in my opinion, the third round being closest. But again, he landed the bigger shots, and I believe he landed a takedown at the end of that round, too. So, yeah, I, I like that. I'm excited to see a new champion. You know, we, we said when Strickland won the belt that we would be betting against him. Uh, whoever he fought um and uh it turned out that way you know paid out you know i thought i think and i still think strickland could have a lot of success if he just stayed um a little bit more uh aggressive in the fight um but that being said you know he had a, a pretty solid performance all things considered uh duplass he was just too much that night so we'll see how it happens i i would love to see Next, uh, I'd like to see Duplessis versus Cannoneer, just to see two super athletic power strikers go at it. I think that'd be an awesome matchup. I think it's more likely that they do Israel Adesanya versus Duplessis, but, you know, I really feel like it's kind of bullshit. I think Cannoneer is deserving of that title shot. He's coming on a two-fight win streak over Strickland and then most recently over Marvin Vittori, where he looked amazing. So I'd like to see that fight personally. What do you think, Jordan? I wouldn't mind seeing Cannonier fight for the belt. You know, it'd be a, it'd be a very fan friendly fight as well. Um, I think if Izzy Izzy will probably be the deciding factor in that one. If he decides to come back early, they're definitely going to make that fight. Um, I think you would be probably smarter to um, have a fight in between that. Duplessis should win that Cannonier fight. Um, that's probably who I would be siding with. Once again, if it gets made, we'll talk about it when we get there. But I would be pretty okay with thinking about that. Honestly, I hadn't I hadn't even put that thought in my head, but. That would be a that would be a solid uh first title fight for um Drickus Duplessis. Yeah. I could see them running it back with Sean Strickland as well. Um I could see that being an, an option that's on the table. Um so it it's the very, very interesting storylines to go off of this yeah. um this du the Drickus Duplessis win. Yeah, there's a few different routes they can go. They could go the Strickland rematch, um, they could do the Cannoneer fight, which I feel is most deserving. Or they could do Adesanya. They've even talked about um, Hamzat Chamayev fighting for the middleweight belt, which I feel like is ridiculous. They're going to do Adesanya. You think they'll do Adesanya? They'll do Adesanya. Yeah, uh, Hassan, the producer of the podcast, saying that they'll do Adesanya. I mean, it really depends if Adesanya is going to you know, want to come back because he's the one that talked about wanting to take a couple of years off. You he know. Um, yeah, I mean, he might do it. And if they if they make that fight happen, I think that's the fight that will sell the most. Player one. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think they'll probably do that out of sign your fight. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe they do Hamzat. Maybe they they feed to the the Saudi crowd and uh, and do Hamzat versus Duplessis in Saudi Arabia when they do that pay per view. Um, I hope not because it'd be ridiculous for Hamza to get a title fight off of zero ranked wins and zero ranked <laughs> fights in middleweight. Um, and, you know, even more so because he can't fight anywhere except for Saudi Arabia or Abu Dhabi or anything like that. So uh, he doesn't have his visa. Uh, his visa got uh, declined this last time. So he can't fight in the States, at least for the time being. Um, just so send, Bo Nickel. Just send like Bo Nickel over there after him. Yeah, that'd be nice. That'd be that'd be sick. I mean, maybe next this time next year, uh, Bonick will be ready for that title shot. But I mean, I I really do like his chances against any of these guys. But yeah, man, um, solid win for Duplessis, hard fought victory, and uh, there's a lot of interesting routes to go with the middleweight title right now. I'd love to see Cannonier get it on merit, but you know the UFC, it's probably not going to happen. We'll see what happens. So. How about my girl Ra Raquel Bennington fulfilling her redemption arc and getting her title fight? I called it. I told yeah. you. 
the a dream good was alive. Yeah, man. And I am, for one, am, am pretty – I don't – maybe it's just the – you know, I'm seeing the negative ones more than I'm seeing the positive. But there's so many people that are like, oh, this is a terrible fight. This is in shambles. Like, it was a pretty good fight. Like, I don't know. I was I was pretty upset at, them, uh, at seeing the internet spoil a really good story. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed the fight. I, I mean, yeah. I thought it was pretty – dominant victory for Raquel Pennington you know I think she could have probably put her gas on her foot on the gas a little bit um in that like third fourth round it looked like Mara Brynasova was completely exhausted and I really feel like Raquel probably could have got a late TKO if she just you know stick to her boxing um but she did fall into that clinch a few times it's kind of been a a tale in her career that she loves to go to that clinch against the fence even when she's having great success on the feet uh, maybe it's just a way to mitigate her cardio, but it really seems like she doesn't have much of a problem with her cardio. So I don't know. Maybe it's a mental thing. But either way, she was uh, very dominant in that fight from the first round out. Uh, Mara Buenosova looked good in that first round, but she completely blew her load. Um, I think she – I really feel like she put too – this is going to sound stupid, but I think she put too much energy in the walkout and the introduction with Bruce Buffer. Like, she was pretty fucking hyped right there. It looks like she had an adrenaline dump after the first round and – was just completely exhausted. I'm surprised that the fight didn't get finished because she was so tired in that third and fourth round. God, um, if Bruce Buffer had a nickel for every time he gave a woman an adrenaline jump like dump stop. like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you think he affords those suits? You know, I don't know, man. He's got all the ladies, bro. Uh, but uh, yeah. That being said, I mean, I I like Mara Bueno Silva. I wanted her to get the belt because I feel like she's gonna be. Uh, she would have been like she has more potential. Um, but at this point in time, Raquel Pennington, the, you know, the craftiness, the, the toughness, it was just too much for her, the cardio, the pressure, um, she's a proven fighter, you know? So I'm, I don't know why I didn't pick her in the lead up, honestly, obviously hindsight's 2020, but, uh, looking back on it, yeah, like Raquel has been in there with some great fighters. My Buena Silva hasn't, and, uh, she's never really been one to come back from, uh, you know, adversity. So, uh, Raquel has made a career off of that. So. You know, solid one for Raquel Pennington. And again, like, it's awesome to see a fighter who's been in the UFC for so long, who's had, like, kind of, like, a middling career, um, turn a corner and get a lot of success. Now she's on, like, a six-fight win streak. So that's pretty awesome. I think that's, if not, I mean, it has to be. It has to be the, the longest win streak at, at women's bantamweight right now. I can't think of anybody who even comes close. Um, they're probably going to do Pennington versus Pena for the belt now. Uh, it's a fight that they've tried to make in the past, but Pena's fallen out. Um so I'm excited for that matchup, and I, I really do feel like Raquel, Raquel Pennington will get it done in that fight. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Juliana Pena, but I don't think her style really plays well into Raquel Pennington's style. I think um, both girls are kind of tough, scrappy brawlers, and Raquel just has a little bit cleaner technique, a little bit better cardio, and a little bit more power in her hands. So I think she'll be able to get it done against Pena. But we'll see. You know, you never know. Um, it is kind of sweet to have a different title fight uh, at Bantamweight instead of, you know, Amanda Nunez just running it at the top, minus a thousand favorite in every fight. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting to see where the division's going to go. Um, yeah, I don't know if we mentioned it on the preview pod, but uh, this fight was the first time since 2016 that the Bantamweight title was up for grabs, women's Bantamweight title was up for grabs, and it didn't have Holly Holm, or I'm sorry, it didn't have uh, Amanda Nunez or Ronda Rousey in the title fight. And it was the first time since 2017 that the middleweight title was up for grabs and it didn't have Adesanya or Whitaker in the fight. So uh, pretty exciting to see those two divisions get moving along. Maybe not the best divisions in the sport, probably on the lower five of the divisions in the sport right now, um, but still pretty exciting divisions and divisions where I feel like the belt can really change hands uh, pretty regularly. So well, uh, and we'll... not to like tangent off on, but sometimes that's what it takes. Like, you know, maybe we we're looking at it from this aspect of it, like, Oh, it's not very good right now, but we see some of these names in the next two or three years that are just starting to get hot or somebody that's like, that, like, you know, eight, nine or on that cusp. We're like, Oh, you know, they were there the whole time. It was just, you know, the division was the opportunity. Need, yeah. It needed a little bit of opportunity to freshen up, kind of get these different matches up matchups in there. So it's exciting. Like you said, to see these, these um these weight classes uh open up not so much i hope the belts don't bounce around too long i hope somebody comes in and can give a nice like good you know year year and a half reign or something like that but it's nice it's cool it's exciting you know yeah yeah i mean it'd be uh i think out of the two new champions i think raquel is much more likely to hold on to the belt for a bit uh just because duplessis kind of has a shark tank underneath him right now um 
And, you know, to, to middleweight's credit, there are some really interesting prospects there right now. You know, like we talked about Bo Nickel, uh, Ikram Alskarov. You got Joe Pfeiffer there, too. Uh, so there, there's some some young blood in the division, a much needed uh, burst of young blood. And uh, we'll probably be seeing a few of those guys fighting for the title in the next, you know, two, three years. Nickel versus Chimaev. Yeah, I think that's a good fight to make for sure. Uh, Hasn't saying they should do Nickel versus Chimaev. But, you know, Chimaev. He 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 wants a title fight coming off of a, a ten day notice. Usman if rolling off give, the couch. If you give Bo Nickel and Hamza a main event of a UFC, there doesn't need to be a title on the line. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, that'd be pretty dope. T- yeah, they'll take that. Like Bo Nickel will take Saudi Arabia money to go fight Hamza. You know what I'm saying? Why not? Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's 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 right there. He's like, I'll take that. That's a that's a payday. Um, I'd like to see Strickland versus Hamza. Honestly, I think if they make that fight, I think that'd be awesome. It'd be a good test for Hamza to fight an actual middleweight contender. And, uh, I think stylistically Strickland can give him a lot of problems. Um, if he can defend that early takedown and jab his face off, if it's five rounds, I really do favor Strickland in that matchup. So I'd like to see that fight. I think that'd be cool. Um, but yeah, let's move down the rest of the card. There was some other interesting matchups on here. Chris Curtis fought... Uh, Mark Andre Burial in that Wait, fight right you, before. You're about to glaze over the fact oh, that Neil oh, got, a, Neil Magny got a KO <laughs> for real. You're gonna put death taxes and Neil Magny's decision got got put to rest, dude. How about that? Neil Magny got a KO. Yeah, I mean, I I I thought that that fight <laughs> happened before the Curtis fight. That's why I brought it up. But um, yeah, man, just uh, a monumental case of fumbling the bag by Mike Malott. Like, I, I couldn't believe my eyes when I was watching it because he looked so good in those first two rounds. He was fighting how you're supposed to fight Neil Magny. He was using the leg kicks. He was using the takedowns. He was using that top pressure and just, you know, beating the piss out of him. I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a 10-8 round in there or two, you know. Um, and then third round comes around, and Malat is completely exhausted. And Neil Magny, like we always say, turns it up as the fight goes on and gets better as the fight goes on. And uh, he was able to really just beat the piss out of him in that the last frame of the third round um got to the mount position Malat was not able to get him off and he just unloaded ground and pound like we've actually never seen uh from neil magny i think that's his first finish and dear god i i, I can't even think of the last time he got a finish let me see he probably um, should have brought he probably should have brought that neil magny out against ian gary yeah yeah imagine um, dude, hey, dude, speaking oh of yeah fun- he got a finish not long ago he he submitted danny rodriguez i forgot about that yeah, but, but I'm talking about just straight up knocking somebody out. I can yeah, if you tell me Neil Magny like yeah, if you tell me that Neil Magny chokes somebody out, I'm like okay, I can see that. But if you tell yeah. me that he put somebody out, then I'm like what? Yeah, 2018 but, was the last time, so it's been almost six years uh, dude, since Magny got a finish by strikes. Man, speaking of fumbling Canadians, my round robin for the Canadians did not work out very well. No, it did not. All. I'm sorry, hey, dude, man. Canada, I love you, but. Dude, get it together. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, <laughs> on the preview pod, we were like, oh, Canada, oh, let's God. go. Oh, now, yeah, it's more like, now it's like, oh, oh my God, Canada. Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, it was tough, man. They they had they had some good fights, too. There's some close ones, really close ones. Um, This next fight being one of those close ones was, I mean, obviously, Mike Malott was winning that whole fight until he got finished. But that Mark andre burial, Chris Curtis fight, I felt like could have went either way. I personally felt like Curtis won. Um, but Burial had a great showing for himself. Um, another uh, case of a fighter not being able to really get out of that first gear. Curtis could have had a lot more success in that fight if he turned it up a bit, was a little bit more aggressive. But, you know, he did enough to win, so good on him. Um, and then there was another really close fight on that main card with Mavsar Vloy versus Arnold Allen. I personally felt like Arnold Allen won. I thought he won the first round and the third round. Um, but they gave the decision to Mopsar Vloev. He landed a couple takedowns at the end of the rounds, which might have swayed the judges. But um, yeah, I felt like Allen did enough to get that victory, and it kind of hurt to see him lose because it was such a, a hard-fought decision, you know? Um, but Vloev looked good. He did what he was supposed to do. His striking looked very improved. Um, Allen was southpaw the whole fight, which took away that jab for Vloev, uh, a jab that's given him you know a lot of success in his fights in the past. He didn't have it as readily available, and I think that kind of translated to a much closer fight than it needed to be for Vloev. Um, But I, I really did feel like Allen landed the better shots in the first and third, and I think he deserved that decision, but it is what it is. Um, neither guy's stock goes down from this fight. I think it was a, a good showcase for both of the fighters, and uh, I'm excited to see if Vloev get a top-five fight now. You know, I mean, that was a top-five fight, but 
you know, to fight like a Yair Rodriguez or, you know, uh, the loser of Volkanovski versus Teporia. I think uh, there's a lot of exciting things for Evlo to do. And for Allen, you know, stay the course. Don't get too discouraged. I think if you fight somebody like Giga Chikatse or Josh Emmett, I could see him smoking those guys. So um, I'd like to see that fight made for him. Um, but yeah, uh, pretty exciting right. fight there in the featherweight division. A lot of split decisions on this card. You had said that, and I'm just now noticing it. One, two, three, four. Yeah, yeah. A few split decisions, a few really close fights, man. Um, and not a lot of finishes. I mean, the, the, the prelims started off really well, the early prelims with three finishes in a row. And then uh, Jill- Jillian Robertson got it done, too. But uh, yeah, but then we didn't see anything until Neil Magny and nothing else after that. Um, but that being said, you know, I don't think it was terrible. I think there was some, some good yeah, fights yeah, in there. Yeah, I'm definitely not mad at it. I mean, you know, yeah. are, we're still talking, you know, how people are still talking about DDP and Sean Strickland, you know, who won that one. So obviously it's a lot better than one of them just going out and putting it out. So, you know, I like it. I'm not mad at it. Yeah. Um, going to that prelim card, there were, there were some pretty interesting fights there and close fights and a couple fights that I thought like the decision went the wrong way. Um, Garrett Arnfield versus Brad Katona. Garrett Arnfield had a great showing here. Uh, his boxing looked very solid those first two rounds. Um, Katona, not a finisher uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So he uh, kind of was fighting a losing battle there. He he went for takedowns at the end of the round to try to steal them, but uh, it didn't work out the way it did for Mozart Vloyev. Um, that third round he won, but the first and second he lost. So he lost that decision to Garrett Arnfield. I felt like that decision was fair. Um, the next one, Sean Woodson versus Charles Jordan. This was a frustrating fight to watch as a Charles Jordan fan. Uh, cause I felt like, you know, he was having some pretty solid success when he opened up, but he seemed deterred from the length and the reach of, uh, Woodson to open up earlier than he should have. Um, that being said, I kind of felt like he did enough to win that fight too. I felt like he won the second and third round. Um, but you know, I'm not a judge. Um, I also had money on Jordan, so I think I was a little bit biased, but, uh, I also don't like Woodson. So I was really rooting for Jordan in this one. Um, but that being said, um, kind of setback for him. It kind of, it sucks. Um, we'll see what happens though. I don't think Woodson has much of a future at featherweight. Uh, I think he does have a pretty high ceiling or a pretty low ceiling rather. Um, and, uh, Jordan is, you know, one of those fighters who wins one, lose one, win one, lose one. So uh, I'm sure he'll come back in a big way in his next fight. Um, and then what I feel like should have been fight of the night, or at least, you know, uh, like honored in some respect, was Ramon Tavares versus Serhei Skiddy, or Sidde, rather. Um, this was a fight between two contender series fighters. Uh, they fought on the contender series, and the referee stopped it way too early. Uh, the guy got dropped, and then he jumped in and stopped the fight while he was recovering. Um, and, uh, they kind of robbed us from the war that we saw this last Saturday. Uh, it was a great fight, super back and forth. Uh, on one side, you had the volume and the pressure and the combinations on Serhei's side. And the other side on Tavares' side, you had some great power and some great boxing. Um, so it was a very interesting fight. I felt like, uh, Serhei did enough. He was able to land great combinations and win long stretches of the fight. Uh, there was points that he got rocked in the second and first and second round. I think in the third round, he might have got clipped at least once, too. Um, but I felt like he did enough to win those rounds either way. I think he lost the first round, I think it was. But then second and third, I felt like he got it done. Um, either way, it was a really great fight and definitely one to to watch if you haven't seen it. I, I highly recommend it. Um, that was on the prelims. Uh, I'm, I'm just now realizing that Tavares did miss weight. So maybe that's why they weren't eligible for fight of the night. Um, especially considering how good the the main event was, I don't blame them for giving that fight of the night. But you know, it would have been nice to see these uh, lesser known guys get some shine. Um, and then Jillian Robertson had a great performance. She looked like a complete stud against uh, Pollyanna Viana. We expected her to have some success against Viana um, because you know Robertson has been such a dominant force on the ground, and that's where Viana's had some trouble. Um, but I didn't think it would look like this. I thought Viana would at least be able to land some good punches on the feet. Um, but it really looked like, you know, anytime she started to open up, Robinson would find her hips and get her down on the ground. And uh, from there, it was just, you know, she was in a world of trouble. And Viana's a, a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. It's not like she was lost on the ground. Um, but Robertson is just like leagues ahead. You know, she's a black belt who taps out black belts. So 
Uh, she was able to really just dominate her. And even though she wasn't able to get a finish by submission like she normally does, she was able to get into a position that Viana couldn't get out of and just beat her up until the ref was forced to stop it. So a uh, solid victory there for Robertson. She continues her finishing ways. Um, she got performance she's... of the night too. Yeah, she got the performance of the night. I think they gave it to her and... Uh... Jasmine. Yeah, Jasmine, Jasmine Vickius, which... That was an awesome fight. Very look at the look at the victory. look at the girl. Look at the females getting the performance of the night bonus. Yeah, I mean it's about damn time. I mean they were the only Canadians on the fight card that won. You know, all the Canadian male fighters lost. All the female Canadian fighters won. All right, um, so yeah, I gotta redact my Canadian men. Get yeah, it together, dude. Step your like, shit up. Yeah, Canadian <laughs> women, keep on doing your. You keep on doing you. Yeah, they know what they're doing over yeah, there. Yeah, guy, gotta learn from them. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. So before we get into that. Jasmine Jazzy Davicius fight. Um, Sam Patterson submitted Johan Lanis. Johan Lanis, I really had faith in him. You know, he has good power in his hands. Patterson has been susceptible to the power shots before. I really thought Johan was going to be able to get it done. Um, but when Patterson got the takedown, Johan put himself in bad positions, man. Like, uh, there was a point where he was fighting off the choke and then he just turns right into it. It was like, he was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm tired of, I'm tired of fighting. Let's go home. <laughs> and uh, Patterson was very much uh, happy to take that choke and got that uh, finish in the first round. Um, I don't know where they go from here. They're probably going to cut Johan Lanis or at least give him uh, one more fight. Uh, and if he loses that, he'll get cut. But well, he, uh, wants to go, he wants to go home anyway. So Yeah, I mean, clearly. I mean, that's what it looked like to me. It is what it is, though, you know. Um, but yeah, that Jasmine Jadson Davikius fight, probably my favorite fight on the night to watch. Um, I hate Priscilla Cachoeira. She's a dirty fighter. She's been in trouble before for eye gouging, for biting, putting her toes in the fence. In one fight, she tried to rip the girl's shirt off when she was putting her in a choke. It was just like, you know, anything she can do to win the fight, she'll try. Um, and uh, she even she got like a, a split decision victory in a fight against one of my favorite fighters. Uh, and uh, what's her name? Uh, fuck. Uh, Jeon Kim. Um, but, you know, I thought she lost that fight for sure. Uh, in this fight, there was no argument. She got the dog piss beat out of her. It was great to see. Uh, Jasmine Jazzy Duvickius, uh landed those takedowns early and beat her up in the top position. And then second round dropped her with a with a beautiful right hand. Um, and, you know, that's the first time I've ever seen Priscilla get dropped from a punch. She's usually known for her chin. Her nickname is Zombie Girl for a reason. Um, but, yeah, that being said... Jazz, Jasmine had a, a very dominant performance, super, you know, well-rounded fight from her, uh, showed off great striking. Uh, obviously, the takedowns were the biggest story of the fight. She had a ton of ground control time and, uh, you know, ended up beating her up so bad in some positions. They showed the the stat count at one point, I think it was like 242 to 13 or something ridiculous. Um, if she didn't set the record for biggest strike differential in a fight, she was damn near it. Um, and yeah, she just dominated her every step of the way. And then third round, it looked like she was, you know, going to go to the decision, but she ended up finding that anaconda choke and forcing Priscilla to, to tap. Uh, very vindicating performance from Jasmine, and I'm happy to see Priscilla Cachoeira lose. I hate her. Um, and then in the opening fight, you had Jimmy Flick versus Malcolm Gordon, and this was a fight where Malcolm Gordon really uh, did not live up to his potential. I felt uh, first round he looked pretty solid, but then he got really tired really quick. And Flick was able to get him down and get that arm triangle choke. And uh, Flick is one of those guys that you really don't want to fall asleep when you're fighting him because he will take advantage of any opportunity that you give him. Uh, very similar to, like, um, I don't know if you remember, like, Jason Knight or any of these guys. Uh, you know, Nate Landwehr, uh, Darren Elkins, where it's like, all right, like, you can be winning the fight, but if you slip up, if you get tired or you slip up, uh, he can find the finish. You know what I mean? So you got to be very careful when you fight somebody like that and you have to be on your P's and Q's for the full 15. And Malcolm Gordon, unfortunately, was not uh, there. Um, he posted after the fight that he's going to retire. Uh, kind of sucks to see, you know, but he's had some real trouble these last few years and especially on the scale. So I think it's a, probably a good idea if you're, if you're, you know, starting to to middle down the road, getting finished in your last three fights and missing weight in two of them. He's probably going to get cut from the UFC. And um, a lot of times when guys get cut from the UFC after being there so long, it's hard for them to, 
you know, climb their way back. So uh, I wish him all the best. Malcolm Gordon's had some good fights in the UFC, so I wish him all the best, and uh, I hope he finds a, a nice life post-retirement, you know. Um, but, yeah, that being said, it's a pretty solid card overall. Nothing crazy. Uh, not not the best card of the year. I mean, there's only been two, but the other one was a lot better. Um, and, uh, you know, we did get uh, a, a few new champions out of it. We got some good fights and a couple solid finishes on the prelims, but, you know, nothing nothing crazy. That being said, uh, the next card that we got coming down, Roman Delice versus Nasruddin Imabov, that has some pretty good fights on there. So I'm excited to break that down when the time comes. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening, y'all. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you. TKO Nation, back at it again. Recapping UFC 297. Already did it. Probably going to come out with something else shortly. And we have that uh, fight look back of Alvarez versus Gaethje uh, in the works as well. Thank you very much, folks. Appreciate you. And uh, have a great day. Take it easy.